Hey, welcome to episode 81 of the Gig Life Podcast. I'm your host, Stevie Taylor. Before we chat to Kev Templey, I just wanted to let you know that you can subscribe to the Gig Life Podcast. So go to the giglifepodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts and hit that subscribe button. To help spread the word, please share the podcast or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review. Uh, that'll help people find us. As you know, the Gig Life Podcast is free. You don't have to pay anything ever. But if you find value in the Gig Life Podcast, you can securely donate. Go to thegiglifepodcast.com and click on that donate button. You can give as little or as much as you like. Any donation will go back into creating the great content for this podcast. Okay, episode 81, Cav Templey. Here we go. Today is Cav Templey. Cav is the lead singer, bassist, and songwriter for great Fremantle rockers Eskimo Joe. The Eskies have made six studio albums, three of those debuting at number one on the ARIA charts, and Juggernaut Black Fingernails Red Wine staying 62 weeks in the Australian Top 50. That's just a few of their impressive achievements. As well as Eskimo Joe, Cav co formed Soul Collective Birds Basement, started a small indie record label called Dirt Diamond Productions. He's written and released some solo music as well as being a prolific songwriter and a songwriting mentor for young musicians. Cav and his wife Beth, aka Studio Cat, also have their own podcast called Hat Jam. In this chat, Cav and I talked about his early days growing up in Fremantle, picking up the bass, almost going to jazz school, forming a school band, winning the campus band comp, which won them a recording session to eventually forming Eskimo Joe, 21 years later, the Eskies are still going strong. We also talk, of course, about Hat Jam Podcast, which you must go and check out. It's really, really good. Just a warning, there's a bit of drug talk and references in this episode, so if you don't like hearing that kind of thing, best not listen to this one today. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Cav Templey. Cheers. All right, I think we're rolling. Kev Templey, welcome to the Gig Life Podcast. Thank you very much for having me, Stevie. It's, it, uh, I'd, I'd like to say it's lovely to be here, but I'm in Fremantle and yes. we're about to you. I don't even know I'm where Sid- you're I'm broadcasting. I'm in Sydney. Okay, cool. You might be able to tell I'm a New Zealander. I've got my All Blacks flag in the background there and my New Zealand flag. and <laughs> Had that I, out for I, Anzac I Day the other day, which was pretty cool. I was yeah. secretly hoping that you were, you know, broadcasting from New Zealand, but, but <laughs> Sydney is also cool. Yeah. Um. All right, let's talk a little bit, you know, uh, the last couple of podcasts I've done, obviously the thing we want to talk about just to start with is is COVID-19 and the immediate impact um, it's had on you. Um, Can you tell us maybe what was sort of happening a couple of months um, sort of before that happened and what you were leading into? Um, We'll talk a bit about that and then we'll just sort of roll back to your early days and lead up up to everything. Well, um before COVID-19 hit and did what it has done, which has basically pressed pause on the whole entire world, which, you know, is kind of nice, I guess. Mm. Um, uh, we were gearing up to have a big Eskimo Joe year. So we, um, ha- we'd just been re-releasing all of our records and um, on vinyl. And uh, as we did that, we, we put out all of the, the B-sides that we'd, we'd, we, we'd done for each record as well. So oh, cool. we're putting out this kind of massive back, like re-releasing our back catalogue on vinyl and, and CD and, and putting out all the B-sides. 
But um, we had just got up to this year. We we're about to um, do a song as a city on on vinyl, which was a big album for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, the idea was, as we were going to put that out in May. It's still coming out in May. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we were going to hit the road and play these massive gigs, which was going to be. A song as a city from start to finish, and then we'd have a little break, and then we'd come on and we'd do Black Fingernails Red Wine from right. start to finish. Right. And we were all really excited about that, and it was all ready to go. Um, and then, uh, you know, we all had to basically stop playing gigs or hanging out with anyone but your family. So it was, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but it was a massive blow to, uh, not just to the fact that we were, we were going to do this this tour that we we all knew was going to be quite successful but um every other show that we had booked was cancelled and everything so completely um, cancelled no no sort of holding back to see if like because uh, I, n- I know a few was, people that have had shows later in the year they haven't been cancelled yet they, they're just sort of holding on for how long i don't know but yeah. well uh there was a, yeah there was a couple that we we'd been paid for and you know we got to keep some of that money and mm. some some gigs that they said they were going to you know reschedule and you know, I don't know if that'll ever happen because you know we're, we're we're one part of the business, but these poor chaps putting on these big gigs are another part of the business. And who knows if if as a organisation these people will exist in a year because yeah. every everyone knows who who does this. You know, we we operate on this this knife point of of whether you're going to actually make money or lose lots of money. Um, so I I don't know if these guys will be around in another year who had all these gigs booked for us. We had a lot of festivals booked, but right. our main thing our main thing was doing this big big tour in the second half of the year. And um, on top of that, I was going to go out and do a whole bunch of solo touring, you know, just to kind of keep you know money coming in mm-hmm. for your family and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but on top of that, we also have uh, my wife and myself do a podcast called Hat Jam. Um, which you were telling me that you were listening to the yeah. Ben Lee episode, <laughs> yeah. which uh, uh, is is the last episode we managed to record before right. we were in America, and we managed to make it back like literally a week before, a week after the the COVID thing hit. So we we're really really lucky. We had just recorded the Ben Lee episode and mm. gone on a plane and got home, and a week later it was like everyone you're not allowed to go anywhere <laughs> until the foreseeable future. Mm. <clears throat> so all of our um. All of our, our things that we were doing from gigs to podcasts to we also do a, a bunch of music education stuff. All the mm. schools had shut down as well. Um, it, it basically all stopped. And, um, you know, we we had to do a lot of scrambling to work out how we were going to continue to pay our mortgage and, mm. you know, feed our children and all those things. And mm. luckily enough, the government, you know, in Australia came through with this job keeper thing. So... You know, we were already paying ourselves some money in Eskimo Joe, so we managed to kind of get the government to to pay us that money, which means we can tread water until the end of the year. Oh, cool. What we've done, what we've done with our Eskies gigs, is we've kind of pushed it to early next year, and as opposed to all these big fifteen hundred capacity venues that we booked, mm. um, we've scaled it back and we've kind of re tentatively booked a bunch of much smaller venues, about seven hundred, and they'll probably be reduced capacity again. So we'll end up playing to maybe 600 people a night, but we'll end up playing for what, four or five nights in a row yeah, right. instead. <laughs> like the old days, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's right, man. Yeah. Hit, it's time to hit the pubs. Yeah. Uh, so, awesome. So, yeah, that's that's our plan. And the other thing is, you know, uh, one of the other things that happened is I finally managed to go platinum on Virgin, you know, airlines. Oh. So, <laughs> who have got that and they've gone into administration. So, I mean, they'll probably be back, but... Yeah, I think I think the main point is I don't think uh, air travel is going to be quite as cheap as it was when we hit the road again. And right. coming from Perth, you know, we're so isolated oh, that yeah. once we do hit the road to do these big, you know, four or five days in a row in a tiny venue gigs, uh, we're going to end up being on the road for much longer periods of time as opposed to going over and playing your big 2,000 capacity venue, then coming home for a week or two. And part of me doesn't mind that. I mean, mm. ev- anyone who plays on a regular basis, um, you know, I think we're really lucky in Eskimo Joe because we've got to this point where we we started in these tiny gigs. We 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 didn't, you know, we weren't one of those bands who just had a massive hit um, and suddenly had a huge audience. Yep. You know, we we did have a few little radio hits along the way, and that helped us. You know, managed to get us gigs, but really how we won our fan base was going out and winning one person over at a time, playing 
endless amounts of shows. And because we were from Western Australia, you know, back in the day in the late nineties to catch a plane, it was like about a thousand dollars a ticket, you know, which was a lot of money. So we would get to the East coast and we'd be there for 10 weeks at a time, just going up and down playing all these venues. And we slowly built it up and slowly built it up. But by the time we kind of were, had, you know, done our, first record and we started to play these you know the big festivals like the big day outs and and those kinds of things um all these people who won over in these tiny pub shows were all there in the front row ready to watch us play um and then we saw that groundswell grow with each record so by the time our second album came out of songs of city Mm. you know we're playing the big day outs and stuff again Mm. it had grown a bit bigger and then we did black fingernails red wine and it finally kind of tipped over and we had a commercial proper commercial hit Mm. Um, it really started to kind of translate. So, um, you know, we were, that's, that's how we used to do it. And, and the funny thing is this, where we're at with the COVID thing, I feel like we're about to walk back into that world again, where we're going to pay for a really expensive plane ticket. Once we get to the East coast or wherever we get, get to, we're going to have to stay there and and make sure that, you know, we make that ticket work and we're going to have to probably be on East coast for a couple of weeks playing show after show. Mm. But the point that I was trying to get to is, is when bands get really big, um, you know, you don't, you don't get to get on those roles where you're playing four or five nights a week. You play one big show and Mm. then you go home for a couple of months and then you go out and you play another big show. You go home for a couple of months. And if you're, if you're touring a new record, you know, you never, you never break through that performance factor where, you know, it's just second nature. You can walk out and you can just, do it, you know, um, amazing things happen in a band when they break through that place. Yep. And I feel like I still have such fond memories of all of the gigs we did up to, you know, the end of the Black Fingernails time because we played so many shows, you know, that's just what we were doing. And um, and I feel like I can still play those songs, you know, in my sleep. But yep. every album after that, we, we played big shows, but we didn't get to play as many shows. So we never broke those songs in as much. Mm. And uh, and I feel like we'll get to you know do that a little bit now with this That's cool. new That's cool. paradigm you know which is uh, you know playing tiny shows again yeah um and the fact that you've you, you know you've you've done it before means you know you you'll know what to expect. Yeah, we we also are a little bit older, so oh, that's we know what <laughs> we know it we know what to expect. We're like, oh boy, yeah, 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 can't can't <laughs> jump around like that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll come back to the Eskimo Joe stuff and and yeah, all that sort of stuff. I want to go right back to where it all began for you, mm-hmm. um, early childhood and all that sort of stuff. So, were you born Fremantle? Yes. Oh well, I was born at in a home birth in um, Mosman Park, which is like a suburb just out of Fremantle. Okay. And um, was there music in your family straight away? Yeah, there was definitely a lot of music around. I mean, my mum sung and played music. Uh, she had been like, you know, a kind of amateur folk musician touring around Canada and those kinds of places. So oh, cool. she, I, I grew up with her playing music in, in the family and I had a brother who was, I still have a brother, <laughs> who was <laughs> who is seven years older than me? Uh, so you know he was probably quite a big influence as well. Like you know, by the time I was like you know eight or nine, you know there was their records that my parents were playing, but then he was listening to like the Police and Eurythmics and Run DMC and you know all these bands, you know, and house music was all starting to happen, and that was all cool and dangerous at the time. Mm. So. That was quite a big influence on me as well, uh, you know, his his musical styles. But then, you know, there were some great records. Like, I, I was a kid of the 80s, so, you know, a lot of the albums that made a big impact on me were albums like Paul Simon's Gracelands mm. um, and, you know, I could go on forever. But, uh, you know, and of course, you know, Eurythmics and, and a lot of those kind of, you know, slightly new wave bands that had been gentrified and turned into mega pop bands. Mm. So... Um, There was definitely a lot of music around, Uh, lots of memories of my mum playing piano and singing, um, and there was always guitars and pianos and bits and pieces around, but it wasn't like, there was no one in my family who was like, you could do this as a profession, you know (laughs) know what I mean? It was that, my mum was more of a visual artist, she'd gone to art school and that was her discipline, and uh, when I became obsessed with music and wanted to, and there was nothing else in my world apart from just playing music that happened more in my teen years 
And by the time I was doing gigs, I remember looking back to my mum, who was this quite talented artist, and I remember being really frustrated at her because I was like, why aren't you, you know, putting on art shows and, you know, doing exhibitions and stuff? And, and she said, you know, when you have kids and you're, you're trying to do a painting and you've got this three-year-old at your feet saying, I've just pooed my nappy, <laughs> then that is your priority as a parent. And, um, and, I, and I understood that. Um, and I think for uh, being a female artist in her era, it would have been very, very hard to break out of that. Yeah, I just had the, the, the image then, well, not an image, it actually happened when I was trying to write something in here and my daughter, she would have been about two at the time, put her hand up onto my computer and she hit command and Z at the same time. Oh! Bang! It was, and I, I, I yeah, lost a couple of tracks there. <laughs> uh, of yeah. all the two two keys she could hit. <laughs> uh, um. So what kind of music was your mum listening to? Um, I remember like a lot of Ry Cooter and Van Morrison. Um, um, you know, the Beatles were, you know, obviously around a lot as well. Um, and like I said, Paul Simon Graceland was was a big one um, in the 80s and, you know, Dire Straits, Money for Nothing, all of that kind of stuff as well. Um, and the interesting thing is, you know, there's there was there were songs around that, that I, you know, paid attention to, but I mean, I'll go back to Van Morrison. He was one of those artists that I like, I, I, like, I know whole rec, like by the time I discovered him as an adult and I was like, oh wow, Van Morrison's amazing. Um, I would, you know, it's that funny thing, uh, how music is just kind of, you know, the roots of, of the stuff that you listen to when you were younger, are, are, they're deep inside of you. And yep. I, I, I like listening to Moondance and, um, uh, and what's the record before that, um, you know, with As I Wander Through the Slipstream. Anyway, the, those two main Van Morrison records, uh, they, I just remembered every single song on the record. I was like, how do I know all these songs? Yeah. But they were there in my childhood and, and I, I might not have been paying, you know, uh, conscious, you know, uh, attention to what was going on, but it was it was seeping into, into my bones, obviously. Mm. I know what you mean by that. You just get used to hearing that whole album because sometimes it's, it, ha- it happens to me a lot with, with Stevie Wonder. Oh, yeah. I'll hear a Stevie Wonder song on the radio and as soon as that song finishes, I'll know that there's like two seconds before the beat of Isn't She Lovely comes on. The, the yeah, right. song, you know, And then I'll start singing it and my mates at work are going, what are you doing? I said, don't mind me. I know the whole I, album. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm I'm sure someone could write a long article about this who's who are way more experienced than I am, but I feel like you know there's there's something so um, interesting about you know the way the the time in our lives when we discover albums, you know, Lou Reed Transformer for me is a really classic one. Like I remember that being around when I was younger and going, I like Walk on the Wild Side, but this is all a bit weird and it makes me feel a bit strange. But then at a certain point, you know, I heard it and I was like, this is genius. This is this is an amazing album. And I still listen to Walk on the Wild Side as a song now. And I'm like, that that's just such a great sounding song, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and a different. And Neil Young is another one. I love Neil Young. And, uh, you know, I just when Neil Young kind of appeared in my life, I felt like it was, you, you know, it was the right time for me to, to discover that album. And sometimes it can be really frustrating because. Uh, you know, there's one of my favorite bands is a band called Spoon. And, uh, I remember being obsessed with Wilco. I still love Wilco. They're one of my favorite bands. Um, but this, this Spoon album had come out and I remember a girlfriend at the time going, you got to listen to this record. And I was like, no, no, it's all about Wilco. And then of course, (laughs) you know, like two or three years later, you go back and you finally discover it and you become obsessed with it. And you're like, oh my God, why didn't I discover it then when it had just come out? You know, I'm like, you know, I'm three years late for this. But it doesn't matter because, you know, you discover that record when you're ready to, you know, receive, you know, that record. And I think it's it's a it's a really interesting thing, like you're talking about with Stevie Wonder. It's like, mm. you know, you know these things, they're they're in you. But there was probably a time in your life where you've you'd forgotten that it was such a big influence on you. Yeah, it's not till you hear the song and you just know. It's also from practicing and playing along to albums as well. Like like I, I play drums, so you would 
sit and you'd play the whole album. So you'd finish a song that was at a certain BPM and you knew exactly how many seconds or how many beats or where to mm. change the beat on your left foot to count yourself in for that next song, you know. And then, of course, you're away from the drums years later. One of those songs comes on the radio and then that, it just snaps back in, eh? See, Inner Visions for me is one of my favourite Stevie Wonder records mm. and a lot of that is because of Stevie Wonder's drumming on that record. Yeah. His hi-hat he's work, he's like, man. he's just, he's, man, he's just nailing it. There's a, I think there's a bunch of footage of him recording that record as well. And I think it's such a almost tragic moment because he had broken out of that little Stevie thing finally and he was his own artist and he had, you know, he was making the records he wanted to make and then he had that accident like just after Inner Visions and lost his sense of smell and he kind of went on a weird tangent after that and his songs are still good but I felt like, you know, the guy was already blind. Why? Yeah, Why yeah. do you have to take his smell as well, you know? Yeah. And I mean like songs in the key of life and stuff, still a great record but for me there's something that Stevie, was at, Stevie Wonder was at his coolest when he was doing Inner Visions, I think. Mm. Agreed. Agreed. When did you first pick up the bass and was there a moment that made you go, oh man, I want to play bass? Well, um, it's, it's a pretty, I'm going to sound like an idiot when I tell this story, but uh, I started off playing violin and I played it from about seven till about 12, I think. And by the time I was 12, uh, there was no violin music that I listened to. So like I never, there wasn't like a, oh, I'm going to listen to this track of by this amazing violinist. So there was, there was no kind of real world thing where I was like, I want to aspire to be that guy, you know. Not, not um, Nigel Kennedy? Well, Nigel I thought Nigel Kennedy was cool <laughs> at the time. Cool, yeah, he was yeah. like, he was like the guy. I was like, I'd like to look like that, but I never <laughs> listened to any of his music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> but, um, but then uh, I was about 13 and uh, Guns N' Roses, uh, no, I was about 12, yeah, 12 years old and Guns N' Roses uh, uh, Appetite for Destruction came out and I was just like, you know, it'd be cool as if I played the bass. And I thought, it'd be, I thought it was cool because I was like, the bass has four strings, the violin has four strings, they're probably the right, same strings. The same they're strings. completely <laughs> different strings. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, so I sat, I, I you know, finally managed to get a bass and uh, I sat down. The first thing that I ever taught myself to play was the opening line to um, Sweet Child of Mine, the do, 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 oh, do, you do, sp- do, do, you spoke do, about do. this in Hat Jam with... Josh yeah, Pike, didn't you? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. So we we're both we we're, people we're both go and, go and listen to Hat Jam. That we'll go and listen to all of them. But the yeah, the episode with Josh Pike. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, so uh, I learned that, and uh, and I, it was so satisfying being able to be not only be in control of my own instrument, like I can l- listen to something and I can work it out, like that that brain you know little connection that I made having to work out that baseline was a massive leap forward for me as a musician. But also the Duff McKagan playing bass. I was like, "How cool is he? I want to be like Duff McKagan." And then I was like, um, "You know, uh, is um, what's the name from uh, Metallica? Cliff Burton." Mm. I was like, "I was like, he's. I want to. I want a Rick and Becker bass like Cliff yeah, Burton. That, so would, cool. that would be cool, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know." And it was that uh, idolizing. It's like guitars are cool because. It's not actually about how well you play a guitar or a bass on stage. It's like if you look cool with that bass on stage, that is, there is there is an endorphin rush you get from that that is like no other. So yeah. that's where it kind of started, and um, and and I became the bass player in the band, and and then in my kind of mid teens, I I got really really technical. I got into jazz, and I got into like you know learning Jaco Pistorius bass lines and those kinds of mm. things, and I got super super technical. And about sixteen, I was about to apply for the jazz conservatorium mm. and I, and I did the audition and the, 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 the people who I was auditioning, they said, look, we think you're amazing, but 16, we don't take people at 16. Um, but if you come back next year when you're 17, we will definitely accept you. And I was like, great. Okay. It's game on. And in that year of 16 to 17, that was when I discovered Neil Young and that's when I rediscovered the Beatles. And that's when I discovered you know, uh, Transformer by Lou Reed. And I, I listened to those songs and there was no, <laughs> you know, none of that was going on in there. It was just like, boom, boom, 
Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. And I was like, that's cool, man. And it, and that was a massive uh, revelation for me in my mind. I was like, it's about the song. What, what can the bass do for the song? Not how many licks can I get in there, but what a good groove, you know, you can still be a technical groove, but a good groove is way better than playing a million notes. Yeah, man. Did you ever play the bass? Jacko, up high. Up, up no. Here? Because right, I, 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 I play bass as well. I've got, yeah. um, I actually went to a bit of a Jacko. I nev- could never really play like Jacko, but I wanted to look like him. So I had my, I've got my jazz bass there on the wall. <clears throat> I had my strap and I had it right up here. And I had the hat. Yep. Yep. I, I was looking through some photos on Facebook the other day. Memory came up and I saw that. Well, I went, Man, what, what I, was I thinking? <laughs> well, you know, I have those moments all the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But um, the one thing I didn't know about Jaco Pastorius until quite recently is he died quite young. Yeah, he did. He, yeah. like, yeah, he walked out of a, a club and, like, some kind of biker dude was like, hey, hippie, you know, with your long hair. And, you know, this guy was a virtuoso. And he turned around and gave this guy some stick and they beat him up and he died, you know. And so, he was only about 27 or 28, like, really, really young. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's pretty tragic. And he'd gone a fair bit off the rails too, I think, you know. They know. all, they all do. They Stevie. all do. Yeah, they yeah. all do. Br- bring in the mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Actually, the people listening won't know what I'm talking about with the mushrooms there because we were talking about that before we hit record. Um, there's another episode of Hat Jam with um, with Cav and Ben Lee. So just go listen to that. I'm not going to say anything else. I should probably explain to the people who are listening uh, what Hat Jam actually is. Oh yeah. Cool. Um, so Hat Jam is a uh, a podcast that I do with my wife, um, and we play this game where we basically have um, a whole lot of names in a hat, and um, and we we get a musician in, and the the musician has to pull out uh, the first name. They they put two names into the hat. The hat's already filled with lots and lots of names. They pull out the first name, and that name has to inspire the verse, and we sit down and we go, okay, cool. So, you know, imagine we pull out Sweet Dreams by Eurythmics. We have to, like, write a verse in the flavor of Sweet Dreams. And then uh, once we've done that, we pull out a second name. And then in isolation, we have to write a whole chorus uh, based on this second name. And sometimes it goes uh, really well. And sometimes, like, with the Josh Pike one, <laughs> it's, like, actually yeah, it's like, really tricky. I think we pulled out James Brown and we're like, oh. <laughs> and you you actually have to listen to the to the Josh Pike um, podcast of the Hat Jam one just to hear him doing his impression of James Brown. James Brown, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, very funny. So we we write a chorus and then we try and stitch these two ideas together. Um, and sometimes it's really easy because the vibes there, and sometimes it's not so easy. Um, and then at the end of it, I say how about you now come back and perform this as if it was a song that you were recording for your own record. Yep. And uh, and then at the end of every episode, we have a brand new song. And they're, they, they're always amazing and really interesting. And uh, and yes, uh, in the Ben Lee one, in the first, I traveled to, <laughs> I generally travel to people's jam rooms to do this. Uh, that's why the whole COVID-19 thing has been very tricky. We haven't been able to record an episode since. But I traveled to people's jam rooms and... Uh, in the Ben Lee one, we're in Laurel Canyon in LA, and in about the first five minutes of the podcast, he uh, <laughs> offers me magic mushrooms, and I had not taken magic mushrooms in decades. I'm not going to say I'm an angel. Of course, I tried many substances. I'm a musician, for fuck's sake, <laughs> but I hadn't done anything like that since my late 20s, and I'm now post 40, so... Uh, I was like, okay, let's do this for the sake of a, a uh, you know, artistic adventure. We're going to do this. And uh, and so I went on the journey with Ben on, on Magic Mushrooms. So you're going to have to listen to the episode if you want to find out what happens. Yeah. And then what the reason I brought up Mushrooms, because we were also talking about how some creatives need to take drugs to just be normal. Just to bring him, bring him back to normal. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> people, artists have famously self-medicated throughout history, and uh, you know, it sometimes goes really badly. But often, um, you'll find most people who write songs will, you know, have a glass of wine or a coffee, at, you know, at the least to do what they have to do. 
Mm. Um, ben is obviously a big fan of psychedelics, hence why he was like, let's let's take a little bit of mushrooms. And I was like, oh boy. Uh, I'm more of a fan <laughs> of just, you know, uh, smoking a joint. That's about as, that's, that's as all I need. I've, I'm like a, a little number, write down some lyrics. But for me, the whole thing about, you know, the relation of, of writing and drugs is that I don't think you need the drugs to create. I think what happens if you are a, um, you know, if you're a, a workman and you sit down and you take writing songs or, you know, whatever you do very, very seriously, you don't need that to make that happen. And generally people will just do that. But I find smoking a joint at the point where I've, driven that idea as far as I possibly can down the road. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to smoke a number and I'm going to sit back and just contemplate what should happen next. And then I find it can be really, really uh, beneficial, you know, and, right. and then, and sometimes I'll, I'll do that and then I'll wake up the next day and be like, what was I thinking? You know, um, <laughs> yeah. Sarah, Sarah McLeod uh, was one of the guests that we had on the hat jam podcast. Yeah. And she, we were, it was hilarious. Cause we, um, after Hat Jam, because we connect, we'd, we've known each other for years. We we had done some touring together, but we hadn't really connected as friends before. And then we did the Hat Jam podcast and got on really well. Had a fabulous time. She's such a funny lady. Um, then uh, we had a offer to write a charity song for the bushfire relief. Um, so myself and Sarah sat down to do that, and we like. You know, we we basically I, I started the song at home and then I sent it to her and she had a little bit of a bit of a play with it and you know we got the lyrics to a point and the lyrics were doing pretty well and then she she wrote back at this one point I was like okay I've done a rewrite of the lyrics because there was some clunky bits and she'd rewrote rewrote lyrics and they'd just gone on this massive tangent and <laughs> and I was like ah oh, it's I think it was pretty good before like maybe a small tweak and she was like. Yeah, I smoked a joint and then <laughs> just started taking myself really seriously and went on this long tangent. So that is the danger with yeah. the with the joint smoking at the end of writing a song is that, you know, you can go on a tangent and it might not be a, be a good tangent. Maybe what you had before was cool. All you need is just a little, you know, just a little, little tweak. <laughs> um, when did you start singing? Because obviously, um, yeah. Well, I th- I think I I don't think I really took myself seriously as a singer until I was about thirteen, fourteen, mm-hmm. um, and that was mainly uh, I just kind of started writing songs when I was about twelve. But about thirteen, fourteen, I started uh, wanting to sing the songs myself, and it was uh, it was more of a means to an end. I was like, well, I don't really want to play this to anyone else. I I just want this to be a sacred moment with me in my room. But there's a little bit more of a backstory to that. Myself and uh, when I was about, yeah, about 14, 15, I'd, I'd already started writing some songs and I was, you know, I hadn't really sung in front of anyone yet. I'd just been, you know, writing these songs myself. And then um, I went over to my friend Rodney Aravena, who's one of my still very close friends. He played an End of Fashion and Sleepy Jackson and stuff. We lived together for a long time, had a great jam room. Um, but before that we were, we were stinky teenagers and I went over to his house one time and he was a much better guitarist than I I was. And we bought like a little bottle of Jack Daniels and I was like, oh, these girls want to meet up at the beach tonight. And he was like, oh yeah, cool. Um, and he, he had one of those guitar magazines and I think the, the latest song that it had in it was Stone Temple Pilots Plush. Oh, and, uh, yeah. It's got a great guitar line. Dan it nah. So he'd he'd learnt it on his little nylon string or whatever and, and so I started to sing it and do like my best like, you know, Scott Wheeler impression for like, you know, <laughs> doing the whole thing. We call it quaying. Uh and, and anyway, so I was quaying away. Anyway, we went to the beach that night and I sung, he played guitar and we both like went off into the sand dunes with different girls and you know, pashed on and did whatever we did and and I was like, bingo, this is awesome. If I sing, girls will actually want to kiss me. This is <laughs> this is like a revelation for a teenager. So um, the next weekend we went out again and, the, and did it again. And next week out we, we went out and did it again. Um, and then I think it was like about three or four weekends in and, and I was just like, this is a winner, man. Like we've got our song, we just play it, we, we go off and kiss girls, this is great. Anyway, he met up with one of my childhood friends, like a girl who I'd known since primary school and, you know, had been really close with her family and stuff. 
So they went off and uh, and pashed that this one weekend, and I I went and pashed some other girl. And uh, next weekend, I was like, "So Rod, are you ready to like you know go out and do that again?" He's like, "Oh, I was just thinking I'd I'd hang out with Isabel again." And I was like, R- "Really?" And because of that, I had to learn how to play guitar because <laughs> how was I going to go to the party, play guitar, and sing at the same time? Yeah. Um, and the beautiful thing is Rodney and Isabel are still together and have two oh. children. So they got together when Rod was like, what, you know, 15, 16. Isabel was about 14, 15, I think. And, yeah, they're still together after all these years. And uh, I was forced to go off and play guitar and sing, and that obviously <laughs> worked out well for me. It's a happy ending uh, all around. <laughs> but, you know, through, through a happy ending all around. Um, no, but, but through that through that horribly, you know, teenage grottiness, um, you know, I became less obsessed with doing it to girls. I could kiss a girl, and I just became obsessed with writing my own songs. And, you know, on I went, and here we are. That's cool, man. Um, okay, so you're playing guitar now, you're singing, you're a bass player, um, you're writing songs. Did you ever get yourself into like a cover band situation or did you kind of always see yourself as a sort of write my own songs, I want to form my own bands, I want to do my own stuff? Was that the path? And and then if it was, then, you know, what was the first, first few bands that you started hooking into? I think some I think some people have the ability that when they hear a song, they know the exact chords and they're like, oh, that's a G and that's a D and this is the melody and I'll sing this over the top. However my brain works, I like to call it the magic number generator. But what happens is from day one, from when me and Rod were uh, playing and trying to pick up girls and all the rest of it, the other part of the story I didn't tell you is that I couldn't quite work it out to work out anyone else's songs um but i could go play my own songs and so that's what i would do to try and impress girls and stuff as i just play my own songs that i was writing um and that was mainly because i was absolutely shit at working out other people's songs i mean i had the beatles complete songbook and i would i could play all the beatles songs but even then i would do completely do my own version of it and Mm -hmm. most of the time when i was working out the beatles i would just get halfway through and just go oh Fuck this and and go and do my own version. I just write. I know my own the cor- I know the chorus. That's all yeah. I need. Yeah, that's, that's right. all I need. Saturday night down on the beach. <laughs> yeah. No, but I did. I wouldn't even get that far. I would be like, right. okay, well, I, here's here's the first couple of chords of the song. In fact, I'm just going to write my own melody and my own, you know, chorus over the top of it. So, you oh, know, cool. I despite the fact that I I was I became really technical as a bass player in my teens. Um, you know, when I started writing on guitar and piano, I, I was, I'd never had really any lessons. So I was a, a lot more Kurt Cobain about how I'd play the guitar. It was all a bit clunky and, and rough. Um, and so I was, you know, no one, I mean, I guess if they wanted a bass player in a band, they could hire me or a singer or whatever, but I was way too obsessed with just writing my own songs. I never mm. really wanted to be playing other people's songs in bands. And even if I did, I would want to do my complete own reinterpretation of it like i just i i don't know why but i was just driven to do that and that's not to say i would hear people's songs and go i want to learn how to play that song but i'd just get halfway through and get the shits with it because i couldn't really work out the chords properly and just turn it into my own song um (laughs) so uh so uh you know by the time i was like about 16 um i got an offer to like play bass in like in like a, a metal cover band for at our like school ref for like a, a gig that they were going to put on it at our high school school ref. So I went in and, and like, you know, met up with all every, everyone. If you're like Australian dude, you, you played metal at some point in time in your life. Um, and so I went in and like learned a bunch of covers on the bass cause I could do that. And I wasn't singing. There was somebody else going, <laughs> you know, doing all the metal <laughs> vocals because yeah. um, death metal was quite big at the time. And uh, we were learning all these songs and stuff, and we did this uh, this gig at our ref, and there was another band who were playing, and they were kind of like, you know, more into the vibe that I was into at the time because I was, you know, like most teenagers of, of the of the mid-'90s, I was listening to, like, Mr. Bungle and, 
you know, um, Faith No More and, and that kind of style of stuff is what I was really into. So there was this band who were a bit more kind of funky, a little bit more Red Hot Chili Peppers, Faith No More-ish kind of stuff going on. And I was like, these guys are cool. And, and there was an after party after the ref and we were all talking and it was just happened, the after party just happened to be around the corner from my house. Um, so uh, they were like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we're playing, but you know, the bass player who was there, he's like, I'm singing, but I don't really want to be the singer. I just want to play bass. And I was like, oh, I've been writing a bunch of songs. Um, and so we, I, they were like, cool. And I said, well, do you guys want to come back to my house and I'll play you these songs? And they were like, yeah, okay, cool. So they came back and I played them these songs that I've been working on. Um, and they were like, great. Do you want to become the singer of, of our band? And I, I, I was like, okay, cool. So for the first time in my life, I didn't have to play bass. Uh, I didn't have to play guitar. I could just sing. And that became uh, my first band, which was uh, myself, Joel Quartermain, who's, who I went on to do Eskimo Joe with, uh, Simon Leach, who went on to be Little Birdie, um, and another guy, Stu Leach, who was Simon's um, brother. And so we, we formed a band called Freud's Pillow, um, we thought we were very, very clever because it's Freud's pillow and it's like a pillow <laughs> yeah. slip, you know, and you have yeah. a Freudian yeah. slip. Oh, we're, we're, oh, it's, it's a, it's oh. a ter- terrible band name, but we thought we, we, thought we were very <laughs> clever. Um, yeah. So anyway, we did that for a while and we entered the campus band competition in Perth and we, we came second. Um, we, didn't, we didn't win, but we were starting to build up a, a, a pretty good following in Perth. That look um, on your I, face. Sorry, the look on your face then when yeah. you said we came second. Yeah, I get the feeling you thought you should have won it. I uh, look. Yeah, uh, look. I, <laughs> I'm. I'm sure. I'm. I'm sure most people have this complex, but we all think that we should always win it. You know, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's just how it is. Um, but no, we we uh, we we didn't win that. And then the ne- that was 1996, and the next year, 1997. By that stage, um, I was enjoying being in the band, but once again, I wasn't really. Uh, the the songs that I was writing, I didn't feel like the the band sounded like that. I didn't really want to play Mr. Bungle, Faith No More ish kind of you know funk metal anymore. That I I had no interest in that. I wanted to do like I wanted to I wanted to record stuff that I thought was was cool. And uh, so I was writing all these kind of like pick. I love the Pixies. That they they had mm-hmm. become one of my most favorite bands at that point in time in my life. So I wanted to do a kind of a folky version of the Pixies, basically. That they, they were the songs that I was writing. Um, and I, I was writing with my friend Stu McLeod, who is in Eskimo Joe, and, um, and I showed them to Joel, you know, who was in, in my band at the time, and, and he said, oh, let's, I, I want to be in a band where, where, you, where you write all the songs and tell everyone what to do. And I was like, well, oh, really? you can be in my band. <laughs> of course, uh, if anyone's ever met Joel, it, it didn't work out like that. <laughs> he's, he's an amazing producer and he's very good at telling us what to do. Um, but we had this magical thing that happened when me and Stu and Joel got into a room for the first time. We had this really great um, chemistry of personalities going on um, and – Anyone who's been in a band who's had a clunky band or this band, you don't really know when when something's going going uh, you know well until you're in, with a bunch of people that it's going really well with. And so myself, Stu, and Joel, we're still in Eskimo Joe, like yeah. twenty one years later, and it's because we have just a very you know musically yes we we you know play with each other and we have a thing that we do in Eskimo Joe, but um, but but personality wise, we have really complemented personalities, and we manage to work in this 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 three way um, personality love in. You know, it's it's why it's, it still works. And as soon as we got in the room, that happened. And so remember the previous year where we had lost the campus band competition. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd I'd written this one song called Sweater, and um and Joel was like. Because he'd been through the Campus Man competition, it was a big deal, by the way, in Perth in the mid '90s. Because you know Triple J was blowing up. You know you had all these cool indie bands that were were doing really well, and um and we saw the Campus Man competition as a ticket out of uh, Perth. You it, if you won the Campus Man competition in Perth, you got a ticket to the East Coast. You you know if you won the whole Campus Band competition, you got to record an EP and all the rest of it. 
So we're like, this is our ticket out of here. We don't have any money. Like, <laughs> this this is how we're going to do it. So uh, we'd, we'd only done like three. Like the, the first three shows we did were the Canvas Band competition. And basically Joel said to me, if you can write three more songs that sound just like Sweater, we'll win the whole Canvas Band competition. <laughs> so so I went home and I was like, okay, cool, three more songs like Sweater. And it wasn't it wasn't what I was doing. Like I still wanted to do this kind of more Pixies like I was probably getting into bands like Blur and Supergrass by this stage, but but I, I was I went home and I wrote three more songs that kind of sound like Sweater, and lo and behold, we won the whole campus band competition, and we oh, were like yeah. we were like and by our third or fourth gig, so you know we got we got to record an EP on that, so and that was part of the competition. Um, and we did that, and then we were really really lucky that uh, a lady called Jane Gazzo, who's still around, um, she heard the EP. And she heard Sweater and she was like, this is a great song and started playing it on the radio. And then we basically started touring and that was, let me check my watch, uh, 21 years ago. And (laughs) and we only stopped this year because of (laughs) COVID-19. That's really cool. Okay. So from, from that EP then, um, how far on until you recorded the first album? Hang on, I'm going to, I'm going to, and I'm going to make Hang on, I've got the list of all the albums here, and I wanted to make it sound like I know what I'm talking about. Sweet. So I'll cut out. So it'll it'll be se- it'll be seamless. Um, uh, this that, this should be part of the pod. This is this is the most entertaining part of the podcast so far. Is you talking <laughs> about this? Um, no, well, we did. What what happened is we started touring because we knew that you know when you it's really hard to explain. Perth is such an isolated place, and in the late '90s, it was even more isolated. And so um, if you got a chance to get on the road and tour, you w- were not going to let that go. So our first two tours on the back of Sweater were 10 weeks long um, and we just literally went up and down the East Coast playing to as many people as we could. Um, and then at the end of that time, we literally begged, borrowed and stole like as much money as we could get our hands on, which is about four and a half grand. And we went to uh, a guy called Lindsay Gravina who had just done the um, Living End record that was doing really well and he'd done all the Magic Dirt records and stuff. And we loved the sound of his records. We are like, he, he, his records sound great. And so we went in and we recorded um, a second EP um, and we had, which had songs like Turn Up Your Stereo and another song called Ruby Wednesday, um, which is Ruby Wednesday, incidentally, was a song that we'd written for uh, our previous band, uh, Freud's Pillow. But we we're like, that's a good song. Let's take that one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so and then we we filmed a big gig that we did with supporting someone at, at a place called the Roundhouse in Sydney. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that venue is still around, but it's like a big uni gig. Uh, um, and anyway, we filmed ourselves doing that. We just kind of synced it up to the the recording and. Uh, we got some interest from some record companies, and that's when we we signed our first record deal. Oh wow, that's awesome! Did you guys ever have, you know, um, through those six albums, did you have any major issues with record labels? And have you got any record label stories? You don't oh, have to name them. So don't name the, I don't want you to name anything. But I've got so many. I don't even know. Wh- I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, so we were, we were being kind of courted by this, this one chap who shall remain nameless, but he was yep. lovely and he'd put a lot of energy into band, but then who swept in, but the, the suavest, you know, coolest cat on the block, <laughs> which was the chap called Pav or Stephen Pavlovich and, um, Pav's still around. I don't think he's allowed to operate anymore because he's used up his <laughs> nine lives, but he started the Vivid Festival um, you know, he signed the Avalanches, he signed the Living End, uh, right. he had a label called Modular. Um, he also had many touring companies called Pav Presents and whatever, but he just kept going bankrupt all the time. But the uh, we he kind of came in and he was just like the cool dude and he was just like, you know what, I reckon you should sign to my label and we're like, sounds great. Uh, and so, and I'm really glad we did because we were in really good company, you know, like the Avalanches were killing it, the Living End were killing it at the time. Um, that it was a really good roster to be on and it was cool because it was indie enough, you know, like they were a subsidiary of uh, EMI, I think, at the time. And um, and we signed to him and, uh, you know, we kind of got through the first record and we, we'd sold gold, but but we thought we should have sold a lot more. And, uh, and we were a little bit upset by the fact that 
um, he had allowed a massive amount of debt to be racked up on our on our bill without checking with us. He just kind of let that happen creatively. In, in, in what in what way? Ah, uh, well, to do with we had a producer who came in and he just kind of let stuff happen. Um, you know, we stayed in hotels, we did bits and pieces and stuff, and no one. He, his job was to kind of really to keep an eye on what was going on and, and he, he was just letting the money be spent because he was just like, not my money. You guys got to okay. pay it back. Um, okay. And the one thing I will say for Pav is that um, creatively he um, is very, very good at putting creatives together. He he has an amazing nose. This is the guy who discovered the Beastie Boys, you know, when they were big overseas and he was like, he brought them over to Australia to start touring. This is the guy who signed Nirvana to do a massive Australian tour on the back of Bleach when no one knew who they were. And then, you know, this is how he made his money. They they came over and Nevermind came out and it was mm. fucking huge. And uh, and they, you know, they honoured the deal and came out and did these venues. And, you know, it, it it's, you know, now Australian folklore, those, those shows. But... um. But Pav, you know, fast forward down the, down the road, he's got himself a record label. And um, so anyway, we were doing that and we very stupidly on bad advice from our manager at the time, um, because you can't have stories about record labels without having stories about the managers as well. These are, <laughs> yeah. it is a yeah. microcosm of relationships yeah. yep. going on. Um, anyway, so we, from our manager at the time, we decided to take up the advice to go to Pav and say, um, we think that you should just release us from our record deal um, because we work really hard and we've sold all these records on the back of us touring and you haven't done shit because you're spending all your time on the avalanches. Some of that may be true, but you don't do that. That is like such a, a, an idiotic move because Pav did what he could do, which was turn around and say, no, I have you guys under contract and now you're fucked because I'm not going to actually do anything with you. You guys just... And so we had this ARIA award where it was like our first proper ARIA we'd been to and, you know, Girl had been critically, uh, our first record had been, you know, critically accepted really well. We'd, we'd, made, we'd made some great video clips. We'd won an ARIA or two. You know, we, we actually had, we'd done really well, you know, in hindsight. We'd actually done a really good, really had a good campaign. And, um, but... You know, we now were between record labels because he w- there was no way he was going to work with us again and release it and put an, put out another one of our records. In the meantime, all of his other bands had pretty much done the same thing with Pav, you know. Um, and so we, we had this weird time where we kind of went home and we didn't know whether we were going to be able to release another record again. Um, but we just started writing and we'd, we'd saved up a bit of money. So we started... We, we found the producer we wanted to work with. Um, you know, we demoed up the songs. We had about a year and a half, almost two years of COVID-like isolation life as a band. And we wrote, <laughs> we wrote pretty much two albums in that time, but we condensed them down to one record, which is A Song as a City, which is our second record. So we went in and we recorded it with a guy we wanted to record it with, a lovely, lovely chap called Paul McKercher, who um, has done lots of records. Um, you can look him up. Uh, but uh, I did. I did today. I great. looked him up today. Yeah, yeah. He's legend. So anyway, we came home. We had it. We had an amazingly recorded record. We were really happy with it. We hadn't mixed it yet, but we became uh, pretty good friends through. Um, Joel was dating this girl called Belinda, who played in a band called Lash. I don't know if you remember Lash. No. Anyway, they they had a record. They were you know out there doing their thing. We did a big tour with them. Joel and Belinda were like, I love you. And started, you know, became boyfriend and girlfriend. And, um, and then, uh, are you going to, are you going to get in trouble from your band mates for taking piss out of them? Uh, they probably take much the piss, more of the piss, piss out of me. Out of I'm, I'm yeah, the yeah. lead singer in the band. I'm the guy who gets <laughs> the most piss taken out of him. So okay. just to be fair, um, no, no, I love my bandmates. They're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of but, uh, so yeah, basically we, through Belinda, we met her, um, A&R person, which is a lady called Kath Harrity. Um, and, and she heard the demos and she was like, this is a really, really great record. Um, and behind the scenes, she got um, a, a, another chap called Michael Parisi, who's still around. He's a, he's a he was the head of our, of uh, Festival Mushroom, 
And he basically, she said, you need to, you need to buy the, their contract off Modular. So he went in and, you know, have thinking that nothing was going on, didn't realise we'd been kind of working behind the scenes or whatever, um, basically sold the contract to, um, to, to Michael Parisi and we went on Festival Mushroom and, and we, we managed to kind of wipe the slate clean and start again afresh, a little bit wiser knowing that, you know, we're not just going to spend other people's money because it's not other yep. people's money, it's our money that we're spending. Um, so we'd learned some lessons and, and all the rest of it, but uh, we did we did that that album, and at the end of that record, we uh, it, it, it became pretty clear that a lot of our problems that we'd had with Pav, um, as well as uh, some a, a massive international record deal falling through, were, were, were pretty much uh, because of our manager at the time. She'd pissed a lot of people off. Um, and so we had to kind of make a decision, you know, we, we, we liked our manager, but she, and we were very loyal people, but we had to make a decision of like, well, if we want to move forward in the industry, no one likes this person and she's ruined all these really, really key relationships. So we fired her and we, uh, went into the studio, um, and we'd already demoed and then we self-produced and recorded Black Fingernails Red Wine. So we got out of this thing and... We had a, a festival mushroom, which was the record label, had been bought up by Warner's, and that had been turned into Mushroom Records un, under Warner's now. And uh, all the same people still working there. Really, really, we had great relationship with them. They were all really cool people, including Catherine Harity. She was still our A and R person. Um, and so I got back home, and I was kind of sitting in my lounge room on my bean bag, and I was like, "Well, what are we going to do now? You know, we've recorded this record. We." we're about to renegotiate a record contract. Like we were out of contract because Festival right. Mushroom had bought our modular contract. That was a three yeah. album deal. And, and we, we had just finished Black Fingernails Red Wine, which was our third record. And so I was like, what are we going to do? And then I was just thinking about the idea of the, of the, you know, thinking about people like Pav and our ex manager and these people, you know, who were kind of there for us and stuff, but it became, it's really, really obvious that you need to find people in the industry who champion you, who get what you do and will listen to you whinge through the really, really hard times because there will be hard times and you will whinge, you know? Um, and I thought about it and I was like, who is that person? And, and I was like, well, Catherine Harity is that person. And so I, I called Joel and I said, I think we should ask Kath to leave her job at, at the record label and come and uh, be our manager. And she'd never been a manager before. And so we got over, you know, we were, we were just doing the last bits of recording of, of the Black Fingernails Red Wine record. And Kath came to visit us at, at the studio and we were like, um, how would you like to leave your job at, Vesuma, at, at, at Warner's and come and work for us as our manager? And she said, okay. And, and she came on board and then she was the one who got to renegotiate our new contract. So she knew how the record company worked, knew all the people involved, already had a great relationship. And our previous experience had been, you know, a manager who had a terrible relationship with the head of the label, you know, and so it was this point of tension all the time. So we had someone who had a great relationship with all these people, went in, negotiated an amazing contract, um, and then on we went. And we're still with, with Kath after all these years. I mean record companies had kind of come and gone. There's about a million more stories I could tell you that I won't. But uh, but really the gist of the story is, is, you know, find those people who understand the band and will, and will champion you in the industry because it is so important. Because as an artist, we're not going to be those people. You know, you need that other person in between you and the rest of the industry. Brilliant. Now that, like, we're on Black Fingernails and Red Wine. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how that blew up because that fucking blew up, eh? When you're writing that album, writing those songs and recorded them and mixed them, did you have an idea that this stuff's really, really good and and um, could potentially be the stuff that gives us that, that commercial success? Uh, I think we, uh, you know, your, your ambition grows as big as your, like, your world, I think, is the best way to put it, because mm. you know when when we had been doing the previous record, we had been the the record before that. We were very indie. We were like, you know, we just want to be an indie band. We want to be cool. We want to be indie. 
Um, and then we did a song as a city and it, and it, it, it allowed us to relax into the fact that we want to write slightly larger ideas. We want to write songs that are a bit bigger than just this, like, Oh, we just, we, we're okay being this little band here. Um, and so at the end of that experience, I personally was like, well, that was really satisfying. I got to, I felt like with a song as a city, the, the, the the sound in my head um, to the songs I was writing to the sound of the record was it 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 was all like as I heard it 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 oh, came cool. out Very good. and so the next place was like well where do you go next and and I my first point was like well I now want to try and write something that has this large kind of mysterious you know all I can the only way I can explain it is I wanted to write something that was widescreen. And, mm. uh, and, the, and my reference to widescreen for me was more like bands like Ice House. For Joel in the band, it was probably bands like In Excess a little bit more. Um, but I, I had been listening to, um, Eurythmics. I'd, I'd rediscovered Eurythmics a lot and I was listening, I had to like Eurythmics best of CD that I would drive around in my car listening to. Um, and I would listen to songs like, you know, Sweet Dreams and stuff. And I was just like fuck, that still sounds so good, you know, and it's got this kick drum going the whole time and this dark chord progression. And generally when I write songs, I'm like, I want to, I listen to a song and I'm like, I want to write a song like that. And so I, I like that. And I also had been kind of rediscovering In Excess and listening to her. I, I don't think I'd ever really gotten into in, in Excess in the same way that Joel had in the band, but I was listening to Michael Hutchins' vocals and I was just like, man, he's just like, he has this mystery about how he sings. And I was like, imagine if you recorded a widescreen record and you could be like, you know, pretend you are Michael Hutchins um, and, you know, and make it sound dark and brooding and cool like your rhythmics because that was my sonic reference. But the other thing is, is with A Song as a City, we had gone to the ARIA Awards and we had been nominated for eight ARIA Awards. And I think we won like, two of them and, and every single award would come up and we lost it to jet and oh. they were like oh. and so we were sitting at this table and like, <laughs> and the winner is jet right and we'd we'd gone to the aria awards like thinking this was our big year and we'd all gone and bought suits like really like oh. like we were go- like we were going to a school ball or something right. and and so we basically rocked up like dorks you know like a, a, a dress going to a school ball and every time jet walked up on the stage <laughs> they looked like rock stars Did they had their shirts they, off like <laughs> Almost. Man, they were just yeah. There was all that you know. Yeah. There was like the hair was out. There was leather jackets. They look like a fucking rock band. And I was like, and so the penny dropped for me. Like with a song as a city, I was like, I was so hell bent on being like, this is an album about I'm I'm an artist. You know, I'm <laughs> writing about being a kid from Fremantle and my experience of you know looking out at the world and you know this is real for me. Um, but you know, we had lost this massive international record deal through that period of time, like I talked about with the manager and all the rest of it. Um, and I, I looked at Jed on stage and I was like, the penny dropped. I was like, it's not good enough to just to be these kids from Fremantle. You have to be the rock star. And so I went home and I was like, okay, what does a rock star look like? Uh, so I got myself some black stretch type jeans. I got myself a leather jacket dyed my hair black, I painted my fingernails black, and I was like, yeah, this this is what a rock star looks like. And I had this idea, which was, if I pretend to be a rock star, <laughs> maybe everyone will believe I'm a rock star. Right. So so on top of that, you know, once I'd got this kind of new rock star disguise on, I was like, well, what kind of songs would a rock star write? And so I started to write these songs where it was these kind of widescreen, you know, expansive songs. Um, and... It was a really nice moment in the band where everyone was on the same page. Everyone was like, yeah, ambitiously, let's do something bigger. Let's do something, you know, ambitious. Because in Australia, you know, I I felt like at that point in time, it wasn't okay to do that. You know, you have bands like, you know, I, I, what's a good example, like Gang of Youths or um, I don't know who else. But they're the only band in Australia who are really – trying to be an international act in that sense was pretty much silver chair at that point in time. You know, they were like, yeah, we're going to be rock stars. Fuck you. You know, what, what album um, would they, around what album would that have been for them? So what was, they, they would have, they would have just come off the back of diorama, I think. Ah, right. Um, okay. 
Right. And, uh, and, you know, and of course you had Jet who had just with a foot and, oh. and you had the Vines as well who, who both um, had had some international success. So, so it was in the air. We were like, yeah, this is possible. Um, and all those things kind of fed into like the zeitgeist of all these little ingredients fed into, um, you know, the creation of Black Fingernails Red Wine. And the songs that we wrote for that, I wasn't pretending to write real songs about my real experiences like songs like new york and sarah and london bombs they're real experiences that i'm writing about mm. but the way that i decided to present them was i was just like let's kick off this the shackles of this we're just a little indie band like what would happen if we wrote a song for the world like something that that if that would sound as good as bands like that we were listening to at the time like i don't know interpol was a band we really loved at the time and a bunch of other bands Let's write a, a record that sounds as international and cool as the as these records. Like, let's fuck the tall poppy thing. Thing. Mm. So we went into that, and on top of that, we decided to produce it ourselves. And we found an amazing engineer called Matt Lovell, who'd funnily enough worked on a bunch of Excess stuff and and worked out of uh, Gary Gary Beer's old studio. Um, and so we were like, "Yep, the stars have aligned. This is going to happen." And so we went there. And it was just such a harmonious experience. It was one of those moments where the stars just aligned. Everyone was on the same page. Um, you know, we got in there, we worked really, really hard, um, and we came out with this result that we were really happy with. But on top of that, I think the reason why it, it did well is that if a band manages to get to album number three, they've hopefully built up three albums of fans. And so by the time you get there, you know, you've already got this, this, these people who are going to fill a thousand capacity venue, but then if you get a hit and the secretaries love it and they're just like, I love this band, you know, um, then, then you have this kind of this tip over thing. Um, and I think that we were really, really lucky to be in an era where that was possible. I feel like in the current climate, you know, um, the, you know, that you can be much more international in your approach. I think the mindset is much better for, for young bands coming up. But I think to be able to, uh, you know, get to album number three, um, it's it's almost impossible because uh, you know there's just there's there's no money in it. You can't sell records anymore, and it's also the world just moves really really quickly. But in saying that, if you're really good at what you do and you're an amazing artist, and I use an example like Tame and Parlor, mm. you know, then good music is good music. People yeah. are going to see it. Yep. Where did you record? Um, Black Fingernails Red Wine. Um, at this really, really great studio. We went back there for um for Ghosts of the Past, mm. um and uh which was our four fifth record. Mm. Um uh we went back there. Uh it's it's um like just near Gosford as you as you kinda cruise out of Sydney. Oh, is um, this Gary this is was was at Gary Beer's studio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when when we were there it was owned by a lady called Darlene Love, who was like a she was a Hillsong country star. Right. Um so it had a bit of a Hillsongy vibe floating around when we were there, which was kinda of weird, but they were cool. They you know, they didn't preach. Mm. Um and then now it's uh funnily enough, it's been bought up by a guy called Scott Horscroft, who um was one of the co owners in the studio that we uh, did a Songs of City in which was a, uh, album, right. uh, a studio called Big Jesus Burger. And, right. uh, and Scott Horscroft was one of, the, one of the chaps involved with that. So when you recorded um, Black Fingernails Red Wine, um, this was obviously a time where they're still selling physical copies. You're still in that time. You, you, were, um, yeah, you were around in a, a, good, a good time where you could make some money off album sales and stuff. When did it well, get... Y- Sorry, go. go. I was going to say yes. You could pay back the the debt that you'd incurred to the record company. Right, right, right. So, uh, how sort of far in mm-hmm. at which album did things start to sort of change there, and the whole streaming thing come out, and physical copies not, you know, well, not being it sold. started to t- is for us. It was an interesting thing because you know you talked about the record company stories. Like we um, we formed our own label in about two thousand and thirteen. And we we put out a bunch of records that we produced of other bands. There's a, a great band called The Chemist, who were probably our favourite band that we had on our label. But we basically formed the label so we could put out our own records eventually. That was the plan. Mm. And um and we were still on Warners by this stage. Um and they decided to make our our record label um, a satellite for their their um their label. 
So uh, we got to we did Ghost of the Past, and then we got to do we we're starting to write our next record, which was the last Eskies record we put out called Wastelands. And um, and the head of the label kind of came to us and said, "Look, you signed this record, so you signed this label uh, under an old deal, which was when we signed our Black Fingernails amazing <laughs> record deal." Mm. Um, and he said, "Look." we're not going to put out another record unless you guys re-sign with us, which is slightly illegal, but that's okay. Hmm. Um, and uh, and so we kind of saw the writing on the walls. We we looked at what was going on with labels and we were like, streaming was coming in massively. It had just at that point in time in 2013, 14, it was just tipping from like the 10 to 90 to the 70 to 60 to 50. And we were like, well, you know, record labels, why would we sign a deal when we can't actually pay back any of this money, mm. you know? So um, so for better or for worse, what we did is we um, we went, well, you know what? How about we just leave the label now? And they said, okay. And, um, and then o- and off we went. And so we did an album called Wasteland and we did it as a, a crowdfunding thing. Because we were like, well, let's just experiment musically. We we decided we were going to make a record that was like sonically and musically quite different. Mm. We knew we'd already had a, a meeting before this record to to say to each other in the band. After this record, we've been on this two year cycle where you know we write, record, release, and and the, and we've been doing that year in year out. And everyone wanted to do some other projects. I wanted to do a solo record. Mm. Joel wanted to produce some other records. Um, so. We decided that we would do one last record and we'd experiment how it was going to be put out because we were like, who's going to pay for records in the future? Mm. Clearly record companies aren't going to be able to do it because no one's buying records anymore. So we did it and it was a cool experience. But the the really interesting thing was uh, streaming is now cranking. It's like the thing. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's more about, you know, the physical releases like, yeah, vinyl sells a little bit and CDs sell a little bit. Mm. But really it's about getting millions or billions of streams mm. um, and record companies have now adapted to that yep. and they've actually become like r- quite good at getting you on playlists and r- quite good at, you know, still working the promo side of things and, and really create creating a, a, you know, a great product. So what we, we drew from that was that it was a great experience. We managed to extract ourselves from our record company, which I think was the right thing to do because mm. we weren't going to sign an, an, a shitty new deal. Um, but we also walked away with an appreciation of what record companies do and the fact that they, they play a really key point, a part in the whole process and what they need to do. We're on, on, on the precipice of, of, um, of the whole industry adapting to this new thing. Yep. What I've seen record companies do since then is adapt. They're, they're very, very good at it. Yep. Um, and they're now like, you know, I, I wouldn't suggest to anyone to sign a deal that they know that they're not going to make any money out of. So if anyone's listening and they are in a band and they get offered a thing called a 360 deal, do not sign it. 360 deal is basically they take your merch, your your publishing and your record sales. Yep. Still only sign for your record sales because that's all they they should they ha- they're entitled to. Um but for the rest of it, I think they're actually doing a pretty good job. Mm. You do some songwriting uh workshops with kids. Yes. Um what's what do you think's the hardest thing for young song songwriters at the moment? Do you think it's um we were just talking before about logic and you know there's all these bells and whistles that that they can sort of play around with and stuff like that. Do you think songwriting's changed and p- people are getting more into that kind of thing or are you still getting the the young kids singing Look, I, singing I think, and playing I, instruments? I, I, I when I see these kids do these songwriting workshops all I can think of is like oh my god I wish I had this going on when I was young. Yeah, this right. would be amazing because we all had to kind of find our way in it. And you know, if someone had have said to us back in the day, "Oh, you should go to school and become a great songwriter," it's just like, why? I just I'm just going to write songs and get better at it. So there's something bizarre about that side of things. But I love that I get to do this um, songwriting thing and and fill this gap in between what kids do at high school and what they do out in the real world, I feel like that's a key part that I would have loved to have learnt back in the day. Mm. Um, As far as, you know, is it easier or harder? 
Um, I think that, yes, um, computers can be a massive distraction from the old school of let's just make it sound good on an acoustic guitar and then it'll sound good on everything. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that gets lost a little bit. But in saying that, again, kids are adapting and they're using the computer as their instrument now and that's that's okay too. There's only problem is there's just crap loads of content coming out. Like everyone's like having a jam on their computer and going, I wrote a song, Yeah, you know, like – um, but I do think that like, you know, the, the really great artists will always rise to the top of the heap. Mm-hmm. A great artist, like, you know, let's use a Kurt Cobain again for, as an example, will come along just at that key moment and remind us all, you know, with this completely different angle, why, why the last era was bullshit and this yeah. era is important. You know, that, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that needs to keep happening, you know, and, um, we can overanalyze writing a good song. I think songwriting is about craft and you should do it every day and you should get better at your craft. Um, you know, as far as computers and all the rest of it go, I'm sure it'll just be absorbed into the whole entire thing at the end of the day. That's really cool. Kev Templey, I know you've got to go and cook dinner. Um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope next year when you, you know, re- get these shows rebooked and you come to Sydney that that we can meet up. Um, that sounds really cool. great. Um, yeah, I'd love that. It's been a pleasure talking to you, man. And, um, Good luck with everything. Hope the uh, your uh, remote um, the the attempt at the remote uh, Hat Jam podcast goes well. All the best. Absolutely. Um, so, how can people find you? If people want to find me, um, you know, obviously there's uh, Eskimo Joe uh, is easy. Cav Templey, one word. I think on Instagram and all other places, and and the Hat Jam podcast is Hat Jam underscore podcast. All the links in the show notes of this podcast. They just go to the show notes and it's all there. Fantastic. No Thanks worries. so much for having us, Stevie. Sweet as Cheers, Take mate. it easy, man. All right. All right. Bye-bye. See you, bud. It doesn't mean I'm not your friend If I don't call you and pretend I feel like having fun So tell me where did I go wrong Tell me Cause no one really knows you When you're out there on your own Drifting like a stranger And rolling like a scum Party's over And your friends have left the room Are you looking for the truth? Cause lately I've got nothing to lose Tell me Cause no one really knows you When you're out there on your own And rolling like a stone Oh